Good morning. We welcome all of you who have joined us today. This morning we come to the final message of our summer sermon series entitled Empowered by the Spirit. In this series we have looked at the period of time between the resurrection of Jesus and the day of Pentecost. And our focus has been on Acts chapter 1, where Jesus prepared his disciples for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Our final text today, we're going back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Um, it's sometimes asked why the early church grew so explosively. We know, for instance, that after Jesus ascended into heaven, approximately 120 men and women gathered in the upper room to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And while there were doubtless other disciples scattered across the region of Israel, this tiny group represented the heart of the Christian movement. After 10 days of waiting, the Holy Spirit came with great power on the day of Pentecost, leading to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, which resulted in the conversion of 3,000 people. At the end of Acts chapter 2, we learned that people were being saved and added to the church every day. And within just a few days, the number of men alone who had believed in Christ had reached 5,000. And Luke tells us that multitudes of men and women were being saved in the early church, including many Jewish priests. New churches sprang up all across Judea and eventually spread into the regions of Samaria and ultimately across the entire Roman Empire. What started as a tiny trickle became a stream that broadened and deepened until it turned into a mighty rushing river that flowed all across the Mediterranean region and eventually to every corner of the earth. And now, after 2,000 years, there are nearly 2 billion Christians, and the number continues to grow. Now, how do we account for the amazing growth of the Christian church, especially in those early critical days? Well, I think it's fair to say that there are many good answers to that question, including the obvious one that God wanted the church to grow, and so it grew. He intended to bless the world through the church of Christ, and so he prospered it. And despite persecution, idolatry, and persistent unbelief, that church grew. But if we examine the early church closely, especially the church in its early infant days, one might even call them the prenatal days, one factor stands out above all others. The early church grew because it had a deep faith in the Word of God. You know, the first believers, they believed that God, they believed in what God said and made His Word the basis for everything that they did. And because they believed the Word of God, they constantly referred to it every time they had to make a big decision. And nowhere is this plainer than in Peter's speech to the 120 disciples who were gathered there in Acts chapter 1. No doubt they had been discussing how to replace Judas after his shocking betrayal and suicide. Should they choose another person or should they leave the position unfilled and go on with just 11 apostles. And after some discussion, Peter rises to address the group. And in verse 16 of Acts chapter 1, Peter says, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. And then in verse 20, Peter introduces his quotations from the Psalms with this phrase in, in verse 20, for it is written in the book of Psalms. 
Now, no matter what we might think of the decision to to uh, choose Matthias as another apostle, I am struck by two phrases that Peter uses here. He said, the scripture had to be fulfilled, or it is written. Everything that Peter says is based on those two statements. The first statement speaks to God's sovereignty over the affairs of men and of his nations. History really is his story, and everything happens as part of God's ordained purpose. The second statement that Peter made, it teaches us that the word of God is a written revelation. It's not a hunch, it's not a feeling, or it's not some mystical revelation. If you want to know what God says, read the Bible. What the Bible says, God says. This is the position of of Christians all throughout history. And these words reveal Peter's two great convictions about the Word of God. The first conviction was that the Word of God is true. And his second conviction was the Word of God speaks to this situation. See, Peter believed that hundreds of years earlier, David had prophesied in the Psalms about the betrayal of Judas. Peter also believed that by studying the scriptures, the early church could find out what God had to say about their particular situation. Now, that is a very high view of biblical inspiration. What this teaches us about the word of God, well, there are some lessons that we can draw. And here's the first lesson, divine human authorship of scripture. Now, notice carefully how Peter chooses his words. If you go back and look at verse 16 again, it says, the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David. Now, you cannot find a clearer description of divine inspiration in all the Bible. Uh, theologians sometimes talk about the dual authorship of Holy Scripture. And what they mean by that is, is that, for instance, Moses sat down to write the first five books of the Bible. And he wrote using his own words, his own vocabulary, and so did David when he wrote the the Psalms, and John when he wrote his gospel, and Paul when he wrote his epistles. Every man writes in his own way, reflecting his own personality. But how do we know that what they wrote was what God wanted written? Well, Acts chapter 1 verse 16 tells us that the Holy Spirit spoke first. He spoke through the words, through the mouth of David, through the mouth of Moses, through the mouth of John and Paul and all the rest of the biblical writers. It was their words, but those words came first from the Holy Spirit. And because they come from the Holy Spirit, those words are true and accurate and trustworthy and inerrant and infallible. Now, this doesn't mean that the Bible writers wrote Scripture by taking dictation from God. If that were the case, then they would all sound the same. But it does mean that God superintended the entire process so that when Moses and David and John and Paul sat down to write, they weren't writing just their own words, but they were writing God's words. That's why you can read pretty much anywhere in the Bible and have complete confidence uh, what it says. I mean, if it's in there, you can count on it. You can believe it. Even though in one place it's law, 
In another place, it's history. In another place, it's poetry. And in another place, it's prophecy. The books of the Bible don't sound alike because they were written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years. But each part of the Bible is the true word of God because the Holy Spirit spoke each and every part. Now that brings us to a second lesson we can draw from this, is that God's foreknowledge of all human affairs. See, the text teaches us that nothing ever catches God by surprise. Because he's God, he knows about every element of history, every event before it takes place. He knew all about Judas before that traitor was ever born. Consider just exactly what that means. He knew that one of the disciples would betray the Lord. He knew that Judas was a a thief at heart. He knew that Judas would go to the chief priest with a wicked offer. He knew that Judas would settle for 30 pieces of silver. He knew that Judas would offer a a shameful kiss on the cheek. He knew that Judas would try to give the money back. He knew that Judas would commit suicide. And God knew that Judas would one day end up in hell. And most importantly, God knew that the betrayal of Judas would mean death for his son, Jesus Christ. And he knew all of that, and yet he did nothing to stop it. He could have stopped it, but he didn't. Why? Because God had a higher purpose in mind, one that would make absolutely no sense to anyone else. You know, I find great comfort in this truth because all of us face situations in life that make no sense to us. And those moments of grief and heartbreak and despair and defeat and personal ruin, we may be tempted to think God doesn't know. He doesn't know anything about what's going on. But we're wrong. God knows everything, and he has allowed it to happen for reasons that make sense to him and no one else. A third lesson we can draw from this is is the certainty of God's sovereignty. You know, Peter claims that God knew all about what Judas would do, and he even quotes scripture to prove his point. This had to happen, he says, because God planned it that way hundreds of years earlier. Now, some of y'all may have a problem with that thought. You know, over the last few years, I've had a couple of folks in our congregation ask me pretty much the same question. They word it sort of differently, but they ask the same thing. If God planned the betrayal of Jesus, then how can Judas be guilty of sin? And it begins to sound as if Judas didn't have a choice. But he absolutely did have a choice. No one forced him to steal money from the disciples' money bag. No one made him go to the priest. No one made him take 30 pieces of silver. No one made him kiss Jesus on the cheek. He made all of those choices by himself. Let me say it this way. God didn't make Judas betray Jesus. But God knew that Judas would do it. Judas freely chose to do what he did. And it was exactly what God said that Judas would do. Was Judas cursed from the beginning? No more than you or I. His choices took him where he ended up. And had Judas made different choices, someone else would have fulfilled all the scriptures down to the tiniest details. You say, I don't understand that. 
Well, if it's any consolation, I don't fully understand it myself. But you know what? I'm okay with not knowing everything there is to know about God because he is so far above me. Uh, just listen to this passage out of the message translation. Isaiah 55, 9. For as the sky soars high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work. And the way I think is beyond the way you think. See, we know that God is omnipotent, but sometimes we also forget he is omniscient and omnipresent. He is omnipotent in that he has all power. And we know that God has all power, and we shout amen whenever the preacher talks about the power of God. We have no problems forgetting that attribute. However, God is also omniscient in that he knows everything. Now just let that sink in for a moment and consider the ramifications of that statement. If God knows everything, then he certainly knows where you were, you know, on Friday, September the 4th. He knows that. And he knew where you were at on July the 5th, uh, 2010. And the bizarre thing is he knows where you're going to be on October the 25th, five years from now. God knows those things. He knows precisely where you are right this moment. And we understand all that because that fits into our nice, neat box of what we understand about God. But there's another part of this that doesn't fit so easily into our nice, neat box. God also knows where we're going to be next year at this time. God knows where we're going to be five years from this time. Do you know what you're going to be doing a year from now? I don't. But think about this. God knows where you're going to be. God knows exactly what you're going to wear. God knows what you're going to eat for breakfast that day. God knows what you're going to have for lunch that day. He already knows all of that. He knows exactly what kind of mail you're going to pull out of your mailbox one year from today. God knows what the weather's going to be like five years from now on this day. He knows what the news headlines will be on that evening. He knows the exact time you will crawl into bed and turn your light out three years from now. You say, how does he do that? Well, that leads us to the third attribute that we forget about, that God is omnipresent. Now, what that means is that God is everywhere present. Now, unfortunately, we hear this one and we limit it to geographical, geographical uh, constraints. We think, well, that simply means that God can be in Ohio and China at the same time. Well, that's true. But the omnipresence of God far exceeds geography. God is also everywhere present in time. He is not bound by time constraints as you and I are. You know, in the science field of physics, there are folks who are trying to find ways to time travel. And they always throw out these paradoxes, you know, like, well, what would happen if you went back a hundred years and you met your grandfather and he accidentally got struck by lightning because he stood too close to you in a thunderstorm while you were talking on your cell phone? Now, I'm not sure who you would be talking to on your cell phone a hundred years ago, but let's go with it for the sake of argument. If your grandfather dies, would you ever be born? Well, if you are not born, then how can you go back and talk in a cell phone in the middle of a thunderstorm? See the paradox? Yeah, there are folks who are getting paid to study such deep mysteries of the universe. But we as humans really don't understand time. Well, God is not limited by paradoxes. He can exist in the past, the present, and the future all at the same instant.
God knows where you were 10 years ago because he's there right now. He knows where you are right at this moment because he is here right now. And he knows everything about 10 years from now because he is already there. Even as you and I speak, God is already there. Now, do you understand that? I don't really understand it myself. But I'm okay with that because he's God and I'm not. Uh, to quote the old song, we'll understand it better by and by. And the fact that we don't understand, that simply means that he's God and we're not. So, you see, Judas had a free will to choose, and he chose to betray Jesus. And God told us in prophecy what choices that Judas would make, centuries before Judas was ever born. I also know that twice the Bible says that Satan entered Judas when he betrayed Jesus. Now that seems to complicate matters because now you've got Jesus and Judas and Satan and God all in the same story. How does it all go together? Well, behind the betrayal of Jesus stands Judas, and behind Judas stands Satan, and behind Satan stands God, and each of them have an, a role to play in this unfolding drama. But God gets the last word every time. That brings me to a fourth lesson we can draw from this, the relevance of Scripture today. See, Peter believed the Bible spoke with divine power to a particular situation in history. And you and I need to believe the same thing today as we face the challenges of a changing world. Uh, years ago, someone clipped a Sunday cartoon from the newspaper and gave it to me after church one morning. It's from the comic strip called The Wizard of Id, which is set in some unnamed medieval kingdom. And in the first frame, the king says to his advisor, this kingdom has become ethically and morally bankrupt. And the advisor walks out of the room and he thinks to himself, Call it a trickle-down immor immorality. And the next frame shows the king looking down over the walls of the castle as thieves rob innocent citizens. And in distress, he says to another advisor, what this kingdom need is a code of ethics. And the second advisor had a bright idea. You can tell because there was a light bulb above his, his, his head. He says, wait here, sire. And in the next frame, he returns with a book in his right hand. He says, here you go, sire, the complete book of ethics. Where did you get this, the kings ask? At the royal motel. There's one in every room, the advisor says. <laughs> End of cartoon. But what truth it tells. The answer to America's problems can be found in every motel room in this country. It's called a Gideon Bible. Now, I, I pray that every senator and congressman and, and, and everyone involved in our government would once again consult the Word of God instead of reading the latest opinion polls. What a different nation this would be. You know, George Washington declared, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. You know, we have every reason to be deeply concerned with the moral and spiritual situation in America. Unfortunately, too many people seem to believe that as long as they have a good job and money in the bank and their investments are making money, it doesn't really matter who our leaders are or what kind of morality that they follow. How far we have fallen from the biblical standard, which declares in Proverbs 14.34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I'd like to wrap up our time this morning with four statements of personal application. Can we still believe the Bible today? We can 
and we must. But what will that mean for you and I? Let me just give you four applications of that. Here's, here's the first application. We must settle the question, is the Bible the Word of God? You know, I, I've told you before about the turning point in the late Billy Graham's ministry. Just before his famous Los Angeles crusade in 1949, he was assailed with doubts about the Word of God. Certain people had warned him against becoming a Bible preacher because that would brand him as a narrow-minded fundamentalist unable to reach the educated masses. And Billy Graham had heard the seductive theories of liberal theology, and he wondered if he should keep preaching using only the Bible as his text. Finally, one night in an agony of doubt, he went out into the woods of a well-known Christian retreat in Southern California. It was called Forest Home. And there he wrestled with his doubts and wondered what he should do. Finally, he laid his Bible on a rock and he knelt down. He began to pray and he said, Oh Lord, many things in this book I do not understand, but thou hast said the just shall live by faith. And I have received from thee, I have taken by faith. Here and now, by faith, I accept the Bible as thy word. And you already know the rest of the story. By his own admission, everything that has happened in Billy Graham's life goes back to that night in Forest Home when he laid that Bible down. He knelt before God and said, Oh God, I do not understand everything in the Bible, but I'm willing to believe it and I'm willing to obey it. You know, you and I need to come to that same decision, that same conclusion in our lives if we are going to be effective for the Lord. If you harbor doubts about the Word of God, you will remain confused and spiritually stunted, and your ministry to others is going to lack power. A second point of application I'd like to give you is that we must saturate ourselves with the Word of God. See, it's one thing to believe the Bible. It's another thing to love it. Charles Spurgeon said you should read the Bible until your blood becomes Bibeline, <laughs> you know. Uh, how many of us saturate ourselves with the Word of God? Did you know that the average American home, the television is on an average of eight hours a day, seven days a week? That's why we know a lot more about J-Lo than we do about Jehoshaphat. That's also why our lives reflect the values of the world. We watch what they watch and we read what they read. No wonder we live like they do. If we want to see God's power at work within us, we've got to saturate ourselves with the Word of God. And not just one time, but day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. You know, many of us have been on a spiritual junk food diet at the world's table. Your life can change, but you've got to change your eating habits. Change your spiritual diet, and your whole life will be different. A third application we can get from this, we must use the resources at our disposal. Do you realize how many resources are available to you today? You know, 50 or 60 years ago, if you wanted a study Bible, you pretty much only had one choice and only one. They used to call it the Schofield Reference Bible. You know, today there are many dozens of wonderful study Bibles on the market. You know, right now I can go back to my office and go online and look up at least 15 good websites where I can study the Bible. 
And using the notes in those study Bibles, I can discover the meaning of virtually any passage in the whole Bible. And it is all free except for the cost of a computer and internet service. Now, if you're not into computers and internet, for a small investment, you can buy two or three study Bibles and have the equivalent of a whole library on your desk as you study. Uh, I personally like the MacArthur Study Bible, uh, the Nelson Study Bible, the NIV Study Bible, and the Life Application Bible. You know, they have really nice uh, large print version of the Life Application Bible, which is good for those of us who are starting to squint when we read. And I'm simply pointing out that we live in an age where there is a wealth of good Bible study material available for a modest price. There is no reason for any person in, in the congregation to remain biblically illiterate. Buy a study Bible, or two, or three. You'll be glad that you did. A fourth application I can raise would be, we must pray the words of Psalm 119, verse 18. In all your Bible study, I recommend that you use the words of Psalm 119, verse 18, as a guide. It says, open my eyes, that I may see the wondrous things from your law. Because the Bible is the Word of God, we will never understand it properly without the aid of the Spirit of God. We need the Holy Spirit's help to open our eyes to see what it is that God is saying to us from His Holy Word. Let me leave you with one final thought. Peter said the Scripture had to be fulfilled. That means that whatever God says will eventually come to pass. How do I know that? Because God will never contradict his word. The word of the Lord stands forever. Heaven and earth may pass away, but God's word will never pass away. One Sunday several years ago, after I had finished preaching, a young girl who was in our service stopped and pressed some paper into my hand, and she said she had written something as a gift to me. And when I looked at it a little bit later, it turned out to be a little handwritten book entitled, God Really Does Love Us. And the first page is a child's drawing of a cross with a heart and sun shining upon it. And the caption read, God loves us. The second page showed a young girl kneeling before Jesus on the cross. She was telling him that she loved him. And the final page showed Jesus on the cross with the words, God really did die for me. Now, where did she learn such truth? I think I know the answer. See, many years ago, most of us learned to sing a little song that goes something like this. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And what's the last line? The Bible tells me so. Indeed it does. Thank God for the word of God. Because without it, we would never know about Jesus. And without Jesus, we could never be saved. But the Bible is true, and it is the Word of God. If you still have doubts, I encourage you to read it for yourself. And when you do, you will discover for yourself the most wonderful truth in the world. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so.
Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for your word. Father, we just thank you that you speak to us through the words of, of, of the Bible and, and how that you strengthen us and encourage us. And Lord, you give us the answers that we seek in our lives. Father, we pray today that we would find refuge in your word. Give us a love for your word. And Father, we pray that in those times when we go through life and it's tough and it's, it's discouraging, help us to rest in your word. Father, thank you again. We just ask this in your precious name. Amen. We thank you for joining us today, and thank you for joining us in this series, Empowered by the Spirit. We trust that it's been a blessing for you. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to begin a brand new sermon series, a fall sermon series that asks the question, have you seen the church? God has a church called the Church of God, and she is the Bride of Christ. And I hope that you'll join us as we discover the church of God as revealed in Scripture. Don't forget, we'll be back this Wednesday evening at 6.30 for our live online Bible study on the life of the Apostle Paul. This week, we're going to be on part 19 of this study, looking at discipleship on display out of Acts chapter 18. This Bible study series is on the life of Paul. It's only online. It's the only place that you can view it, and so I hope that you can join us. If you miss any of the, the Bible studies or sermons, you can check them out on Facebook, or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Just type in Lebanon First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube, and uh, you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using your Google account and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So hope you can check that out. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.